many of the same passages that I used first to uh, introduce it, though I've fiddled with it uh, uh, along the way. And yes, the hope is that these will mean something more uh, this time around than they did uh, before. But I thought for this last time I would just uh, recapitulate what seemed to me the big points uh, uh, from the term. Uh, so first of all, uh, a reminder that what we read is from Seller's very first writings. Uh, if we leave off his master's thesis, which they obviously put a gun to his head and made him write, uh, he failed twice to write a dissertation, once at Oxford and once at Harvard, and so wrote nothing, published nothing, until he was 35, uh, 1947. And what we've read is <clears throat> by no means everything, but most of what he wrote in the next 15 years, from 1947 <coughs> to 1962, so from when he was 35 to when he was 50. Um, he wrote 40 papers in that time, um, which is a lot. Um, he didn't write any books. Uh, in those days, that wasn't a form in which analytic philosophers much um, uh, exercised their talents. But some of those 40 papers were really large. So for instance, uh, EPM, uh, that was three, three lectures, uh, 120 pages uh, in the uh, printed version. Uh, if we put together the three uh, nominalism essays, the grammar and existence, which was two long essays, uh, abstract entities, which is one quite long paper, and naming and saying, uh, that would make a nice book. And it seems to me he, sh he would have been well advised to have put that out uh, as a book. Uh, of the things we haven't uh, read, um, Time and the World Order is 150 pages long. Uh, concepts as involving laws and inconceivable without them is just about 100 pages long. Uh, he wrote a lot of stuff once uh, the dam was broken. And by his own account, what broke the dam was uh, the scales falling from his eyes with respect to what he called the new way of words. Uh, he'd been reading Carnap since the 30s, but he finally, he thought, got it, why philosophers should uh, be philosophers of language first, why philosophy of language was first philosophy. And at that point, he really um, found that he had a lot to say about uh, uh, a lot of topics. So just from a sort of human interest slash professional point of view, I think it's interesting to think about this great philosopher having this uh, really golden period. Uh, it's personally embarrassing to me that I believe that uh, none of the work that he did after 1962 is of the quality of the work that he did during this period. Uh, that insofar as he had genuinely new ideas uh, after that, they really weren't very good uh, ideas. Certainly nothing like the plethora of really brilliant ideas I think that he had during this period. And it's personally embarrassing to me that that coincides with him coming to Pitt. Uh, when he was at uh, the University of Minnesota is when he started um, the, the first um, nine years uh, of our period. Uh, for the next uh, five years of that, he was at Yale and was absolutely miserable. Uh, didn't talk to anyone there, uh, just was looking to get out, even though it was the number two philosophy department in the country at the time. Uh, but the political situation there was divided between 
uh, tough-minded philosophers of science, science and logicians on the one hand, and people who mostly read the history of philosophy on the other. Uh, he wanted to reach out to all of them, but was he going to spend all of his time trying to solve the interpersonal and, and intradisciplinary problems of that department? Uh, no, he pulled in and did, uh, did his work. Uh, he came to Pittsburgh and was blissful for at least the next uh, 10 years in his personal uh, and uh, collegial situation. Wasn't really doing the uh, top drawer work anymore. Was that because he was 50 years old and he'd had the ideas he was going to have? Or you know, were there interactions with his environment? Uh, I don't know. Um, I hope we didn't spoil him by, uh, by bringing him here. Uh, so when I think about the shape of his thought during this uh, amazing 15-year period, uh, I think of three sort of central foci uh, of it. And uh, at the heart of it is the way he thought about the descriptive, or we could say representational dimension of language. Uh, he has the idea that uh, a mistake common uh, to empiricists and rationalists alike including their uh, 20th century uh, descendants and heirs, is that they were global descriptivists. Uh, they used the representational model to think about everything. Uh, the difference was, uh, at, at a very high level of abstraction, that the empiricists had a narrow picture of representation and description, and said, well, anything that didn't fit that narrow Procrustean uh, picture uh, was illegitimate, um, was a mere expression of emotions, or was simply a confusion, a confused use of language that didn't correspond to any actual uh, concepts. Whereas the rationalists, and here you would include the uh, idealists, the later idealists uh, among them, they saw that things like modal vocabulary and normative vocabulary were absolutely critical to uh, our thought uh, and so expanded the representational model to put all sorts of uh, extravagant stuff in the world to be what was represented by for instance, statements of laws of nature or uh, evaluative statements about uh, justice as uh, a form of the good. Uh, thought of all those still on a representational descriptive model uh, of s describing things that are there in the world. Now, he doesn't tell us when he had the idea that uh, that common root, the commitment to global descriptivism, or today we'd usually say representationalism, to a representational model, he doesn't tell us when he had that idea. Uh, did that antedate his conversion to the new, to the new way of worlds or not. Um, what he does tell us is that already when he was at Oxford in the mid-30s, he had the idea that uh, when we're thinking about modal vocabulary, instead of thinking about it in terms of its supposed origin and experience, the empiricist way, we should think about it in terms of its role, of, role in reasoning. Now, that's something the rationalists would have said, too. But thinking about roles of reasoning, roles in reasoning, well, maybe there could be more 
principles and reasoning than describing or representing. So I don't know. I can. It seems to me the two hypotheses are he had that idea, but didn't know what to do with it uh, because he didn't have a model of uh, what other things you could do with language that were or with concepts um, that were respectable but non-descriptive, non-representational. Didn't have an alternative uh, model, and so when reading Carnap. He saw Carnap giving a non-descriptive but respectable role to one special kind of expressions, metalinguistic expressions, expressions he used to talk not about how things were in the world, but uh, how the language worked. Then he could put those. Then he could put those together and say that's when the scales fell from his eyes. Or the other way I can imagine it being is that those two realizations came together, that he didn't really have uh, this diagnosis of the common mistake that uh, oh, philosophers, I think he would have said, all previous uh, philosophers uh, had made. Uh, this interacts with the question of uh, how his uh, understanding of understanding of and engagement with Kant evolved. We know that um, he studied Kant at Oxford. Um, his father didn't like Kant, thought he was a bad uh, idealist. And Sellers, uh, when he went to Oxford, had not intended to do philosophy. He did PPE, philosophy, politics, and uh, economics. But he wanted to do the politics and economics uh, side of it. He was a politically engaged sort of man of the left. Uh, and that was what he went there to do. It seems to have been the reading of Kant that pulled him back uh, unwillingly into, uh, into philosophy. But we don't have that unwritten dissertation to tell us, well, what was it about Kant? How was he, you know, what was he doing? Um, so one story is that uh, Kant is the person who saw this common uh, representational paradigm as too constraining in our thinking about concepts, because Kant had the idea that besides concepts whose principal expressive job it is to describe or represent uh, empirical goings on, there are concepts whose principal expressive task it is to make explicit features of the framework that makes describing the antics of empirical, uh, uh, empirical objects uh, possible, namely his categorical, his pure uh, concepts. So it could well be that uh, the sellers already saw that from Kant, uh, but didn't know how to make contemporary use of that idea. And he could be forgiven for that, because I think we still don't uh, have a good idea about how to do that, apart from the ideas that Sellers has uh, given us uh, about it. But at any rate, uh, uh, I think absolutely at the core of his thought is uh, this anti-global descriptivism. Uh, so for instance, in uh, passage six on page one, one of my uh, favorite passages uh, here, once the tautology, the world is described by descriptive concepts, is freed from the idea that the business of all non-logical concepts is to describe, parenthesis, before the Tractatus, this descriptivism or representationalism extended to logical concepts. That's what logical atomism was all about. If you look at Russell in the teens, uh, looking for what could be represented by 
what, what conditional facts were, or negative facts were, never mind probabilistic facts. You know, what features of the world is it that uh, negative existential claims uh, represent? Uh, you, you can see this representationalism just bending everybody out of shape. But the Tractatus said, no, no, uh, logical concepts have this other role. That was really what, uh, uh, that, that was the thin leading edge of the wedge for uh, Carnap to take over then Tarski's idea of a metal language. Um, once the tautology, the world is described by descriptive concepts, is freed from the idea that the business of all non-logical concepts is to describe, the way is clear to an ungrudging recognition that many expressions which empiricists have relegated to second-class citizenship and discourse are not inferior, just different. And here he could have said, uh, apropos of the character that he introduces in his very earliest work, and that we see right through this period, metaphysicus, uh, the interlocutor who stands for the rationalist, for the uh, idealist, it's open for metaphysicus to say, uh, yes, my understanding of real connections, uh, of what's expressed by law-like connections among universals, and even talk about those uh, universals should be understood in a non-representational way, that it's fun the functioning of such talk is not uh, inferior to representing how things are. It's just different. This, I think, is the, the overarching slogan uh, that uh, he has. And if you look over at the top of two on page 10, uh, it's from the same essay as the other. The idea that the world can, in principle, be so described that the description contains no modal expressions, and here he's, his paradigmatic modal expressions are not the operators necessary and possible, but subjunctive conditionals, is of a piece with the idea that the world can, in principle, be so described that the description contains no prescriptive uh, expressions. And this is, he's referring to this tautology, the world is described by descriptive concepts, uh, but thinking, well, there are other things that you could do. Now, this same, this same thought, I think, uh, is at the center of the later Wittgenstein's thought. Uh, he had pushed the representational paradigm as far as it could be pushed in the Tractatus, uh, seeing that it could be pushed that far only because he could tell a different story about logical expressions. But he came to see that besides uh, the expressive job performed by logical expressions and that per of picturing, representing, or describing that was performed by ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, that there were all kinds of other functions that language could perform all kinds of other expressive roles uh, it could have. Uh, in a way, Sellers has uh, an interesting, well, Sellers has an interesting via media here. Uh, in a way, it's a heroic attempt uh, motivated by Carnap, a matter of what he made of Carnap rather than Carnap's own view, that says, no, I'm going to assimilate all those other functions that language has to metalinguistic uh, functions. I'm, I'm going to say that the other respectable thing that you can do with words, other than describing or representing how things are, is uh, to talk about talking. Uh, now, there's two... Uh, interesting exceptions to that. He never thought of logic as meta-linguistic, but he never actually wrote about how he did uh, think about logic. We just have no discussion of that. He uses it as uh, part of the expressive toolbox of the philosopher. Uh, 
given the things he says about truth functions, uh, I think the best conjecture is that he thought the Tractatus had pretty much settled how uh, logical expressions work, and that that was an auxiliary function of the descriptive representational function of language. Uh, but it is uh, uh, worthy of note that this systematic philosopher who wrote about practically everything never wrote anything about the philosophy of logic. What would sellers of this period say to maybe like a flat-footed response to say, well, you're, you're really a, you're still a representationalist. Talking about talking is a way of describing talking. So you're not really you didn't stop describing. You're still just describing, just at a le le like a level removed from the base level. Okay. Well, that's uh, something he did think about. Uh, so if we look at, page, at the quotes on page two, and I want to uh, come back to these. Uh, in in eleven, we characterized a language as a system of norms. Uh, a norm is always a norm for doing. Uh, knowing a language is a knowing how. Uh, in 12, the meaning of a linguistic symbol is entirely constituted, constituted by the rules that regulate its use. Uh, in 14, it's only if there's a pragmatics that's not an empirical science of sign behavior, so not describing it, which is a branch of the formal theory of language that the term is rescued for philosophy. And it's only then that the analytic philosopher can hope to give a non-psychologistic account of the key concepts of traditional epistemology. In 15, man is a creature of, not of habits, but of rules. Uh, and then getting to the uh, key passage is 16. A rule, properly speaking, isn't a rule unless it lives in behavior. Uh, in attempting to grasp rules as rules from the outside, from without, we're trying to have our cake and eat it. To describe rules is to describe the skeletons of rules. A rule is lived, not described. Now that sort of lays down, okay, he doesn't think that the talk about the rules is describing them. I mean, it's madding, maddeningly uh, uh, inexact about exactly what we are doing when we're doing that. But it's true, he's, he's going to say of uh, the meta language that matters that it's not descriptive. And that's one of the ways in which he parts company from Carnan, who did think that these were uh, descriptive or representative, but of uh, language, uh, of language use, which Carnap also thought of in terms of rules, but uh, let me see, do we have this? Somewhere in here it should be. Well, maybe I didn't get this in there. Somewhere he says that stating a rule is not describing anything. Um, that's um, that's going to be the claim. Uh, so. Anyway, I wanted to uh, assimilate the later Wittgenstein with Sellers in both of them coming to reject global descriptivism or representationalism and seeing, at least in Sellers' historically uh, informed view, that everybody except Kant uh, had really been governed by this represent, representational uh, paradigm. That's what uh, Descartes uh, bequeathed to us. And that the empiricists and the rationalists were just making complementary mistakes, uh, either ruling out as illegitimate uh, 
uh, a whole raft of important concepts as the empiricists did, or uh, creating metaphysical monstrosities by understanding the use of those expressions on a descriptive representational model uh, as the classical rationalists did. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just like a bit um, wondering how this line that you're articulating now um, meshes with the sort of other line that you've been pushing throughout the course where uh, you know, taking something to play an expressive role, for instance, modal vocabulary, doesn't preclude us from also um, taking it to play a descriptive representational role. Um, so you've maintained that sort of Sellers wasn't really clear on this distinction, um, but really we ought to be, for instance, uh, both modal expressivists and modal realists, expressivists in the saying, in the doing, but realists in what you're saying. Um, and I'm wondering how that sort of meshes with the sort of Wittgensteinian claim, for instance. So I, I mean, you, you said that you'd want to say the same sort of thing about logical vocabulary. Um, is that do you take that to be incompatible with, with Wittgenstein and the Tractatus says it's like basic uh, thought is that the logical constants don't represent? Um, would you say, well, really, what he ought to have said is they don't just represent the. <laughs> I don't, I'm I mean, wondering how okay, yeah, these uh, different lines. Okay, together. good. I mean, on the specific. Um, Okay, so, so the general claim is that Sellers treats these as mutually exclusive. Either you uh, play an expressive, indeed categorial, uh, in the Kantian sense, role, or you play uh, an empirical descriptive role. Nothing can do both of those. And my claim was... Uh, when we look carefully at the metalinguistic roles that he thinks these expressions play, paradigm for him is always the modal uh, uh, expressions, uh, we see that uh, in order to, to, to give this sort of unified picture of all the respectable things that, whose principal role is not description or explanation, under the rubric of metalinguistic, he's had to expand the notion of metalanguage meta to include pragmatic uh, metalanguages. Uh, so, right, in, in 13, on page two, to talk about awareness two, is to, to use a pragmatic meta-language. A pragmatic meta-language includes a semantic meta-language as a proper part, just as a semantic meta-language includes a syntactical meta-language as a proper part. And it's only if there's a pragmatics that's not empirical science of sign behavior, but which is, well, here, formal theory of language is uh, looking at rules rather than, you know, it involves the statement of rules uh, philosophical propositions are propositions in the pure theory of language, the pure syntax of pragmatic meta-languages. So, so the claim is he had to expand the notion to pragmatic uh, meta-vocabularies. And then I say that opens up the possibility that uh, his uh, meta-linguistic analyses uh, are specifications of what one's doing in using expressions rather than, in the first instance, expressions of what one's saying, uh, even if by saying uh, one hues to a descriptivist or representationalist picture of saying. So that at least the way is open for thinking of these roles as not being mutually exclusive. Now, and I suggested that for some of them, paradigmatically modal vocabulary, uh, but I would extend this to, to normative vocabulary as well. Uh, once one understands that the uh, principal determinant of uh, the principal expressive role of uh, these kinds of vocabulary is to let you say what it is you're doing when you uh, use some other kind of vocabulary, some metalinguistic in a broad sense, uh, that for them we can then see 
how playing that expressive role can, as a consequence, uh, make intelligible also a secondary parasitic derivative uh, express, uh, uh, representational role. They're not going to go in a box with ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary because the ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary doesn't stand to some other vocabulary in a metalinguistic expressive uh, role. And uh, as a result, its uh, representational role, ordinary empirical descriptive vocabularies, representational role, can be understood without understanding its metalinguistic, whereas these others don't. But I don't claim that that has to be true. Uh, some expressions work that way and others don't. And among the ones that don't, is, as far as I can see, is logical vocabulary, which uh, is metalinguistic uh, in a broad sense, but in a different sense, I think, than modal uh, and normative uh, vocabulary uh, is. And I don't see any role to play. I don't see any representational dimension to it. So you don't think there are, for instance, conditional facts, even if they're in this way that there are like modal facts? Right. OK. Um, I mean, I also worry about um, whether the traditional category of logic logical vocabulary is really a natural kind because I do think there's a representational role to subjunctive conditionals and I think of that as logical vocabulary but it's not paradigmatically so. Uh, so the ones that I uh, really don't see as having um, uh, representational content are the Boolean helper monkeys. The uh, conjunction and disjunction. Um, negation as an expression. Well, the material incompatibilities, there's a descriptive uh, dimension to that too. OK, so uh, I was suggesting that um, Sellers and Wittgenstein together reject uh, global descriptivism or representationalism if we think of that as the idea that uh, the expressive role of all unconfused uh, vocabulary is to represent the way things are. Uh, some vocabulary merely purports to do that, uh, but that's sort of the linguistic job. That they reject. Uh, but then Wittgenstein uh, is uh, a pluralist. Uh, indeed is polymorphously, perversely pluralist. He thinks that there's an unsurveyable uh, multiplicity of possible things to do with language, uh, just as uh, there's an unsurveyable uh, multiplicity of jobs that tools could do. Uh, remember, there's passages where he says, if you think, no, no, I mean, tools are for and here, you know, he's thinking like hand tools, you know, the, the workman's tools, uh, are for like attaching things, or uh, where he's saying, yeah, and you're thinking, uh, well, hammer and nails, or a screw and a screwdriver, or a glue and a brush, they, they all have that function, or changing the shape of things, and their saws uh, uh, will, do, will do that. He says, but you're not thinking of things like a spirit level or a plumb bob to get things straight. You're not thinking of the builder's pencil. Uh, you're not thinking of his tool belt. Uh, and when you start to think of those tools, well, how many things are there that you could do with tools? And basically his view is, if you give me a list, I'll always be able to find some things you left out you can do with it. That's the, the sort of unsurveyable. It's not even a determinate totality of uh, jobs you can do with language. Uh, 
and uses the tool metaphor for this. The Sellers has this intermediate ground between uh, global descriptivism and uh, Wittgensteinian uh, wild-eyed pluralism. Uh, he says, no, the other respectable things you can do are metalinguistic. Uh, and he's going to stretch the notion of a metal language so as to try and make that so. Uh, and that's a heroic undertaking, I think, to, to try and assimilate all of those to uh, a metalinguistic model. Uh, and, and I think, though this is something he never explicitly talks about, that he's clearly motivated by thinking about uh, Kant's notion of categories as uh, having the expressive job of making explicit features of the framework that makes description uh, possible. Uh, so, so he's thinking, well, that that's, uh, that that's a good notion of uh, metalinguistics meta or categorial function. And he's struck that many of the things that uh, philosophers were puzzled about, particularly empiricist philosophers were puzzled about, can be assimilated. Uh, to that. Um, among them, uh, modal vocabulary, uh, the uh, vocabulary of universals and uh, propositions, uh, which was one of the principal uh, points of contention between empiricists and rationalists, whether these things uh, existed or not. Semantic relations, what's expressed by semantic vocabulary, talking about meanings, which uh, early Carnap had extruded from uh, the realm of emp empiricist respectability. Uh, he was very unhappy about that because it seemed to him in some sense that uh, with the new way of words, that what he was talking about was meanings. But uh, he, the, the only tool that he would allow himself was uh, descriptions of uh, syntactic rules, uh, of rules specifiable in a meta language uh, of the sort that Hilbert had approved, where you just say how finite strings of symbols can be manipulated. And when Tarski came out with his theory of truth, uh, Carnap breathed a sigh of relief. Uh, it took him five or seven years before he could uh, incorporate the new sort of model theoretic conception that, yes, this was going to be the way empiricists could bring semantic vocabulary on board. Sellers gives a completely different uh, account of semantic vocabulary. What you're doing when you make a meaning statement is functionally classifying something. And you're functionally classifying it by mapping it on to some expression. Uh, remember the illustrating sign design principle uh, that's behind dot quotes. Uh, when you say uh, on the other side of the Rhine, Rot means red. What you're doing is functionally classifying the sign design rot uh, as playing the same functional role in German, mutatis mutandis, that red plays in our language. Functional classification. Well, that's not describing it, uh, at least when you think about functions in the normative way. It's subject to, it's governed by rules that correspond to the rules uh, articulating the meaning of red in our language. But it's not describing those, uh, those rules, it's doing something else. So modal vocabulary, uh, ontological talk about universals and 
propositions and facts, uh, semantic talk, and uh, Sellers says phenomenological talk, by which he means talk about how things look or appears, how it seems. Uh, remember, he gives ultimately a metalinguistic account of that too, uh, tells us what you're doing when you say how something merely looks uh, to you. I mean, parenthetically, there's some backsliding on that when he gets worried about your image of a pink ice cube, uh, where he's not content to give that uh, sort of an account. But those are four fundamental kinds of expressions that philosophers had found puzzling, uh, the normative, the ontological, the semantic, and the phenomenological, uh, all of which he wants to give this metalinguistic account of. Now I said there are two exceptions that seem to me glaring exceptions. He doesn't talk that way about logical vocabulary. Uh, though I think one could, and I would say should. And he doesn't talk that way about normative vocabulary. And again, I think he could and he should, but he doesn't. When it comes time to give us an account of normative vocabulary, uh, we never get that account for discursive normativity in general. What we get is an account of moral normativity in terms of we intentions. Uh, these are I think on the last page of the handout, passage 24. To say that a certain person desired to do A, thought it was his duty to do B, but was forced to do C, is not to describe him as one might describe a scientific specimen. One does indeed describe him, but one does something more. And it's this something more in which which is the irreducible core of the framework of persons. What does this something more consist? To think of a featherless biped as a person is to think of it as a being with which one is bound up in a network of rights and duties. From this point of view, the irreducibility of the personal is the irreducibility of the ought to the is. Uh, one's doing something more like stating rules than describing is what he's saying. But even more basic than this, though ultimately, as we shall see, the two points coincide, is the fact that to think of a featherless biped as a person is to construe its behavior in terms of actual or potential membership in an embracing group, each member of which thinks of itself as a member of the group. And then in 25, so the conceptual framework of persons is the framework in which we think of one another as sharing the community intentions which provide the ambience of principles and standards, the rules, above all those which make meaningful discourse and rationality itself possible within which we live our own individual lives. A person can almost be defined as the being that has intentions. Well, remember earlier, uh, he said uh, in 15, passage 15 on page 2, to say that a man is a rational animal is to say that man is a creature not of habits but of rules. When God created Adam and he whispered in his ear, in all contexts of action you will recognize rules, if only the rule to grope for rules to recognize. When you cease to recognize rules, you will walk on four feet. Now that's, that's that framework of standards that he's talking about, this principles and standards, principles and rules, which make meaningful discourse and rationality itself possible 
within which we live out our individual lives. Uh, so to complete the scientific image, we need to enrich it not with more ways of saying what is the case, science can handle that, that's the scanty mensura, but with the language of community and individual intentions. So, I mean, here he's saying, contrary to the way I put it a minute ago, uh, not just moral uh, normativity, we're to understand all of it uh, in terms of these we intentions. Oh. Now that won't work. And Sellers gives us all the raw materials to see that that won't work. Uh, intentions are propositionally contentful states. They're conceptually contentful states. Uh, you can't understand the normativity that articulates uh, concept use in terms of an explanatorily more primitive notion of propositionally contentful states, propositional attitudes, intentions, that's like trying to understand the meaning of terms in terms of the contentful belief states of the ones who are learning the language. Uh, okay, maybe all this stuff comes together. Uh, he's said in passage 20 on page 3, uh, anything which can properly be called conceptual thinking can only occur within a framework of conceptual thinking in terms of which it can be criticized, supported, refuted, in short, evaluated. To be able to think is to be able to measure one's thoughts by standards of correctness, rules, of relevance of evidence. In this sense, a diversified conceptual framework is a whole which, however sketchy, is prior to its parts. Um, he's echoing Kant on space being prior to its parts concept of space being prior, uh, and cannot be construed as the coming together of parts which are already conceptual in character. The conclusion is difficult to avoid that the transition from preconceptual patterns of behavior to conceptual thinking was a holistic one, a jump to a level of awareness which is irreducibly new, a jump which was the coming into being of man. So this is the, one of McDowell's favorite passages is Wittgenstein talking about the light dawning slowly over the whole. Uh, that's a more gradualistic picture here. Uh, Sellers is endorsing a saltation, a jump uh, that he's saying. Whichever way you think about it, um, all this comes as a package. It, you can't understand normativity in terms of intentions thought of as contentful in advance of them having uh, instituted uh, the rules for applying concepts. Uh, we can't think about the rules for applying concepts in terms of what our intentions are. Uh, what was behind my saying that he had a theory of moral normativity here once discursive normativity is up and running, it's at least a colorable theory of specifically moral reasons and inferences that uh, they should be understood in terms of communal intentions. Uh, I'm not tempted by such an account uh, myself. Uh, it's overdetermined for me for one, uh, I'm a natural kind skeptic about moral reasons. It's not that I don't think moral reasons are reasons, but I don't think there's a kind of reasons that are moral reasons. I think that's basically an 18th century view that should have died with Kant. Um, but insofar as there are uh, moral reasons, I'm not myself 
um, tempted by thinking of them uh, as instituted by explicitly propositionally contentful intentions. Uh, I'm much more tempted to go uh, with Kant and Hegel, uh, what Christine Korsgaard calls a constitutivist view that uh, moral principles are making explicit, the way I'd put it, commitments that are implicit in being a discursive creature at all, being able to act intentionally. Uh, that's a very different view, a sort of categorical view. It's open to sellers. He didn't uh, adopt that part of the Kantian uh, of the Kantian picture, though he probably thought that in appealing to intentions, uh, the Kantian will is all about uh, intentions. But this part of Sellers just seems to me uh, half baked. He had some ideas, uh, and those ideas were not something that could really be worked out given. Uh, their ultimate incompatibility with other uh, with other things that he saw. So I think of him as just not having an account of uh, discursive normativity. Uh, in any case, insofar as he made gestures towards it, he wasn't thinking of it as uh, in terms of a distinctive expressive role as making explicit the commitments that are implicit in our practical reasoning. That's the way uh, I would think one, uh, one would approach that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So as you're reading Sellers in um, section seven of philosophy and scientific image of man, do you take it that he's falling into what you um, elsewhere talk about as an I-we picture rather than an I-thou picture? And do you take it that the criticisms that you're levying against him are, in effect, just the same criticisms that you've pressed against certain I-we views? I mean, I was taking it that the criticisms uh, I was making were independent of, uh, of that. At, at any rate, not thinking of them as resting on uh, those uh, claims, because I was thinking that the same uh, arguments that he uses against someone who thinks a Gricean, say, who wants to understand the meaning of linguistic expressions in terms of uh, the beliefs and intentions of <coughs> so far uh, in the story pre-linguistic beings. So for Grice, uh, you make your utterance have the non-natural meaning that P by using it with the intention of bringing it about that uh, your audience believe, comes to believe that P in virtue of their recognition of the content of the intention with which you uttered it. And so it's this is of a piece with the infant mind saying, ah, there's one, I see another one. Yes, there's a similarity. Ah, by the powerful inductive methods of John Stuart Mill, that must be what mother means by red. Uh, that, that the picture that you could have these complicated reflexive states um, intending that people do things by recognizing the intentions which is part of the we intentions. You have to know that everybody we intends the same thing in a pre-linguistic uh, environment. Uh, no, you uh, have to understand the contents of your states by analogy to uh, the contents that public utterances uh, uh, can have. And it seems to me that that set of arguments already is enough to contest this uh, this picture. I mean, I would then uh, you know, want to add the complaint about uh, I-we pictures, uh, because that notion of we is, I would say, already a fully normative notion, the notion of a community. 
that sense of saying we with people, that's taking up a normative stance toward them. And so it's not something in terms of which one could understand discursive normativity. But I, but I think he, he doesn't need to you know, go along with all of that in order to deploy the raw materials he's made available to argue against this sort of view. So, so the last point you make, that the we in question is, as you put it, already fully normative. Do you take it that that's something that Sellers is denying here? Because I mean, it's, I think you're right, I mean, but I also think Sellers is saying that. <laughs> so, so I mean, the question is, what's the privileged explanatory role of, that the notion of intention is being called on to play here? And I don't see any that is licit by his terms. Um, whereas I do see, against the background of, a, uh, of an up and running discursive uh, set of discursive practices, constellation of discursive practices, uh, trying to pick out distinctively moral normativity in terms of we intentions. And in the other essays where Sellers talks about we intentions, that's his target, uh, is uh, the moral normativity. Uh, so I would, would prefer to discount uh, the wave of his hand uh, here uh, in the direction of understanding rationality in general in terms of we intentions. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, there is a burgeoning uh, interest in Seller's practical philosophy. There was just a book. Um, uh, on his, the first book on his practical philosophy was just published. Uh, maybe something can, can be made of that uh, in thinking about moral reasons, then maybe in thinking about practical reasoning more generally. I despair of a route from that to discursive power. Okay, so uh, rehearsing, you know, what by now uh, is a familiar point, I've suggested that the, the anti-descriptivism, uh, the, the anti-representationalism, uh, anti-global descriptivism, global representationalism, using that as the exclusive model for understanding concept use. Uh, that, I think, is the overarching uh, principle of, of uh, Sellers' system. Uh, it's what ties together uh, the different parts of it. And his idea then, uh, taking that basic idea which he shares with Wittgenstein, is to give a metalinguistic uh, account of it. Uh, and it's that that ties together uh, uh, his semantic theory, his account of modality, uh, his nominalistic account of universals uh, and propositions, uh, and his account of uh, the incorrigibility of phenomenological uh, talk, uh, which all are quite different topics, but. I think he, uh, he he found a strategy to uh, address all of these. This is sort of the idea that was driving him during these 15 years. Uh, and I've suggested that uh, the places where he either doesn't have an account, logic, or where I don't see the account as successful, uh, the account of normativity. Uh, for some reason, he didn't apply this strategy to them. Um, and it's also striking, if you think of it this way, uh, 
that he never explicitly identifies giving a metalinguistic expressivist reading of these things as a version of Kant's notion of categories. He, he wrote an essay uh, a little bit later than this period on the notion of categories uh, that culminates in uh, an account of Kant's categories. He doesn't say this is the, um, uh, the version of that, that that I'm pursuing. Uh, on the other hand, he does say, uh, look, I'm giving you a metalinguistic reading of uh, principles, of synthetic principles that are knowable a priori, uh, which of course is the um, fruit of uh, the categories in, uh, in Kant. And my guess is that this was for rhetorical reasons, that it was bad enough that he uh, endorsed the synthetic a priori uh, from the point of view of the predominantly empiricist uh, audience uh, that he was addressing uh, without officially buying into more of the transcendental uh, uh, idealism. Uh, but, it, but in his, what, you know, what he thought of as his Kant book, uh, really his only book, Science and Metaphysics, uh, this is not one of the Kantian uh, themes that he identifies. And he doesn't talk about, well, he talks about the semantic vocabulary, but not about the other, uh, not about the other things uh, here. Uh, let me point to another path through uh, another path from his anti-global descriptivism or anti-global representationalism. Uh, besides this metalinguistic expressivism, he gives us an account of description of what you're doing in describing something. Uh, this is making the distinction between labeling and uh, describing. And uh, key passage here uh, is Passage three, page one. Um, it's only because the expressions in terms of which we describe objects locate these objects in a space of implications that they describe at all rather than merely label. Um, he's giving us uh, an inferentialist account of uh, descriptive empirical concepts uh, and saying uh, you can't focus just on uh, their circumstances of application, what it's correct to apply them to. Uh, there's a kind of normativity there. Uh, you, you can only correctly use this expression under these circumstances. Uh, so there can be rules for the use of these things. But if all you've got is those circumstances of application, of appropriate application, what you've got is a label, not yet a description. Uh, and it's not a description because there isn't yet enough to have a content. Uh, to have a content, you have to be describing them as something. And what you're describing them as is a matter of the consequences of applying that uh, label, uh, of using that expression. Uh, when you're 
describing something, uh, there's rules that govern the behavior upstream. When is it appropriate for you to occupy this position, circumstances of application? But then there's also what you've committed yourself to by doing that. What else follows from it? Oh, and you can be wrong both ways if you're not acknowledging the consequences or can't be entitled for some reason to the consequences. Uh, then you're wrong too. So he has so situation in this uh, space of implications is necessary for description. Now, people have tried to make the other kind of account work. Uh, Fodor spent most of the last half of his life uh, trying to make a, an account of representational content work that only looked upstream to uh, I mean, maybe his most successful attempt was what he described as the one-way counterfactual dependence of horses, horse representations on horses. Um, didn't think in normative terms, wanted to do it in lethic modal terms, uh, and I think that wasn't going to work, but also only looking uh, upstream. Uh, and one consequence of both of those is uh, what Fred Dretzky called disjunctivism, sorry, disjunctivitis, uh, that uh, you weren't going to pick out in any way the right uh, circumstances of application if you were just looking at dispositions to uh, uh, respond, respond to things. So I, I think this uh, inferentialist move was uh, a really important one. Uh, for sellers, it's the other side, that, that sort of semantic point about what you need for content. You need a uh, situation in a space of implications, not merely uh, circumstances of appropriate application or even rules for appropriate application. That just gives you labels. Uh, that's the reflection of a pragmatic insight, the one we get in some reflections on language games, that a language game can have uh, language entry moves, uh, language entry transitions, uh, but for them to be language entry transitions, they've the positions you take up uh, as a result of exercising those entry skills have to stand in language, language, have to be bases from which you can make language, language moves uh, in order for it to be a language entry uh, move. So he's thinking pragmatically in terms of positions and moves and seeing the language, language moves, the internal moves, as essential to the entry and exit transitions being language entry and exit transitions. He's thinking about those, okay, and, and so the moves, which are rule governed uh, moves, rule governed transitions in and moves uh, within the game. Uh, so we're going to have to think about those in normative terms. But the space of implications is something like the projection of uh, those rules for doing something, for moving from one thing to another. Uh, and it's because for you to be making a claim, making a judgment, expressing a judgment, uh, you've got to be taking up a position that has consequences downstream as well as appropriate circumstances upstream, that there's a bright line between mere labels and descriptions uh, of things. And this is going to have uh, 
important consequences of this uh, uh, understanding of description in terms of a space of implications. Uh, it's the basis for the argument against the myth of the given. Uh, for something to be cognitively significant, uh, it's got for it to be able to serve uh, for some position to be a position in a space of reasons, it has to be articulated by these relations of implication that determine what moves from it and to it are appropriate. Uh, that inferentialist picture of content is an essentially holist semantic picture. Uh, if the conceptual content uh, is determined at least as finely as the role in reasoning, the position in the network of implications, then you can't have just one concept. You gotta be able to move from the application of that concept to others, from others to it. And so to be taking up a position, to have something given to you, however you got it, you could have had an entry move to get there, but for what you've got, to be cognitively significant, uh, it's got to be a position in this network. So you've got to have learned your way around, or at any rate, be able to uh, move around in this space of reasons in a rule-governed way. So you've got to already have these concepts. Uh, there's nothing that could happen to you that would give you a pos the occupation of a position in this space apart from your capacity to move around it in a rule-governed way. So his critique of the myth of the given uh, is a consequence of uh, his understanding of what empirically describing or representing something as opposed to merely labeling it, uh, which is how he's committed to understanding sort of what the pigeon can do. Uh, now, I mean, later on, he'll give us uh, an account of the kind of representation that animal systems could have, preconceptual uh, picturing, uh, picturing relations. And we're already seeing there in the relation between some reflections on language games and inference and meaning, the pragmatics and the semantics, it's clear that his functionalism in the pragmatics is more basic in his order of philosophical explanation than uh, the semantic inferentialism and so the semantic holism. You know, it's thinking about what you have to be doing in order to be talking and so thinking or believing something, judging that things are thus and so. That's where where he gets this um, um, view from. And we point out that uh, functionalism was not a thing in 1953 when he was writing this, it would be late 60s, and even then when functionalism uh, is first introduced by Putnam, uh, principally by, by Putnam, it was Turing machine functionalism uh, so it was computational. There's not a hint of that in uh, uh, Sellers. It was uh, causal relations uh, were the implementation of these computational relations. Uh, for Sellers, it's rule governed. That's the important. That's the important thing. It's a normative functionalism, and Putnamian functionalism was inside an individual organism. Uh, whereas Sellers was a social normative functionalism. Uh, so that, that was uh, a, a very different sort of thing, but it was in terms of that, uh, of a pragmatics that was social, functional, normative that he's understanding the semantics that distinguishes 
descriptions. The other direction that he goes from this characterization of uh, what describing is the narrower realm that his anti-global descriptivism is saying, yeah, that's not all of it. But I'm talking now about it. all the juice he squeezed out of thinking about that uh, core linguistic function that he still agrees is a core function. Probably the later Wittgenstein has even given up the idea that it's a core uh, function. Language does not have a downtown, he says. For Sellers, it does. It's describing. And the second move is, well, and explaining, which brings in uh, subjunctives uh, and modality. And that's what I'll talk about next, but why don't we take our break? <laughs>